how could anybody guess that particular kind of combination? Uh, it's a piece of history of science, which is by itself interesting. The idea of uh, Alex Muller and Georg Bednold, and they had the idea, and the idea was that they could start from a nickel oxide and by introducing additional atoms and impurities, they could maybe transform it into metal and superconductor. And they worked at this for three years and they failed. It did not work. And they were about to abandon their efforts when uh, Bednos, spending some time in the library, read a paper by two French chemists, Raveau and uh, Michel. Yeah. When, when, we disco when, when we made this, uh, this uh, study, this investigation of uh, cuprates, so the idea was to stabilize this mixed valency of copper in order to generate uh, other new materials with uh, the mixed valency, to make a kind of bronze. And uh, we put in front of copper a basic cations like strontium or uh, barium or something like that in order to stabilize this mixed valency, and it worked. So this is the Na2 CuO4 compound, which has a K2 NiF4 structure, which is a structure type. And you probably all know that this copper would be copper 2 plus. But in order to make this compound have a double valence, which would be copper 2 and copper 3, what we do is to replace partially this lanthanum which is trivalent, lanthanum is trivalent, we replace it partially by a divalent element. So if we lower here partially the balance of this lanthanum, we increase the balance of copper, bringing part of it to copper 3 plus. So in fact, we write it as Na2 minus X, strontium as a divalent, but it could be barium 2, strontium X, Cu or 4. The question is then, as you replace, say typically you replace trivalent lanthanum, by divalent strontium, you are you're adding less electrons, if you like, to the planes, because the lanthanum is outside, and so you're adding more holes. The question is, how far do you have to go before this hybridized copper oxygen band becomes a sort of normal metal? So this was the first step. Then the second step was, in fact, uh, to study, of course, properties. For what reason? Because we discovered that the materials were in fact metallic, like the bronze, like the tungsten bronze of Magnelli. And then they were metallic at room temperature. And then the, the idea was to use them not at low temperature, but at high temperature, at 1000 degrees centigrade, in order to use them as materials for electrodes, for capacitors. This was the first idea. So for this reason, we measure the resistivity versus temperature. And then in order to understand that, then we went to low temperature. But it was not useful for us at that time. We were not looking for superconductivity. And it was not useful for us to go below uh, uh, 90K. So we have just no facility at that time to investigate systematically for superconductivity. So the only thing was to try to see what was running at low temperature. And then we stopped at this temperature, which is a liquid nitrogen, so. Georg Bednortz and Dr. Alex Muller at the IBM laboratories in Zurich discovered that if they used a ceramic instead of a metal for their superconductor, they could get the effect at much higher temperatures. As produced for that discovery, they were told last week by officials from Stockholm, they have both just won the Nobel Prize. I felt uh, like you feel if you are in the clouds, you have you don't you don't have your feet no longer on the ground, um, and I'm pretty sure that this feeling will last for a certain while. We wanted to solve the problem of what is the superconductor that ma that superconducts at 90 degrees, because at that time only the overall ingredients were known, but not what was the compound. It is fun. It is great to be the first person, to know you are the first person who measures clean, single-phase superconductor at 92 degrees. 
Leading scientists from all over the world are meeting in London to discuss an invention which could be the biggest breakthrough since the microchip. It's the superconductor, a man-made material which can transmit electricity without loss of energy. Until recently, such devices have worked only at very low temperatures. But research has shown they could work when they're much warmer, and that could revolutionise electrical goods like computers and bring cheaper electricity to the home. However, as Gavin Scott reports, there are fears that Britain could lose the development race because no one will put up enough cash. The Zurich discovery has set off a worldwide scientific race to produce superconducting compounds which will not only operate with scarcely any cooling at all, but also, even more importantly, can be shaped into useful forms like wire. Here at Cambridge, Dr. Bartek Glowski is compressing a compound of the rare earth yttrium plus barium and copper into a tube. Then he stretches the tube into a wire, bakes it in a furnace to produce the ceramic inside, and attaches pieces of it, suitably cooled, to an electric current to test its conductivity. But crucial though it is to have superconductors in the form of wire if you're going to cut electricity costs, making wire out of ceramic isn't easy.